Hello and welcome to another podcast. Today we're going to continue with the medications. We're going to look at clindamycin. So the uses of clindamycin, as you could possibly theorize, is, is many. It is a pretty useful um, antibiotic uh, that is mostly used in capsule form as an alternative to allergies towards beta-lactams, in particular penicillins and doxycyclines. It's mentioned throughout for various conditions from mouth ulcers to types of cellulitis, diabetic ulcers and mastitis. But its primary use as a means or as an alternative or as a assistant type antibiotic for acute wounds is its use in bacterial vaginosis as a cream. Now bacterial vaginosis is it's a condition that's been argued back and forth whether or not it's a sexually transmitted infection. So most of the jury is sitting on the fence that it is not an STI. However, sexual activity is a good way to spread it. Okay, so the way bacterial vaginosis works is, as I'm sure you're all acutely aware, is the bacterial flora found within a vagina is present and it lives in a slightly acidic environment. Now this is deliberate in order to protect the cervix and the womb from other infections. Okay, so the bacteria that lives in there it produces lactic acid as part of its gly glycogen breakdown. Okay, and the main one found in females is your lactobactericillus. Okay, so that is your normal bacterial flora. Now if you want more information on female anatomy, physiology, and reproductive system, then you can have a look at that episode. Now the way bacterial vaginosis works is it's a mix-up of this normal bacterial flora. So it moves from a acidic type environment of less than 4.5 to a more a weaker acidic to alkaline environment of greater than 4.5. Now this environment encourages different types of bacteria to grow. Now this bacteria isn't normal flora bacteria and it causes more destruction of the vaginal walls and with, with that destruction it causes inflammation. So you get inflammation, discharge and often quite a fishy, odorous smell. Now, bacterial vaginosis is caused by, obviously, this mixed match of bacteria. Now, things that have been hypothesized to make it more likely can just be a genetic background. Okay, certain ethnic groups or socioeconomic groups as well can just be more predisposed to uh, this particular infestation okay now I'm not using word like infection deliberately because again most of the papers don't even refer to it as an infection other things that make it more likely is the presence of viral STIs like HIV or HSV uh, and other bacterial STIs can make it more likely now the use of douches or antibacterial washes or fragrant based creams or washes around the vaginal area also have been linked to increased probability of vaginosis. Uh, increased sexual partners, uh, not cleaning sex toys, things like that have also been linked to uh, increased vaginosis. Now the way it is diagnosed is through clinical questioning and getting symptoms like itchiness and redness, a uh, grayish to white to even yellow or green discharge, a very fishy smell, and vaginal bleeding after sex due to the micro tears. Now, these signs and symptoms are your typical ones. However, a large majority, now the papers range from 35 to 75% of women with bacterial vaginosis uh, are asymptomatic. So none of these symptoms at all. So from there, you can move on to your diagnostic type criteria. Now, realistically, in the field, we're not going to be doing the diagnostic criteria because it is a mixture of a pelvic exam followed by a pH dipstick. Okay, so you do the pelvic exam in order to look to see if it's any other organ-based infection. You 
do the dipstick of the pH strip to see if the pH is greater than 4.5. It's more uh, indicative of bacterial vaginosis. And then there's also collecting a vaginal sample and looking at it under a microscope uh, for things called clue cells. Now clue cells are just vaginal cells covered with bacteria. So what that means is instead of being a natural flora that doesn't eat the cells of the vaginal wall, it now has bacteria that is using the cellular structure of the vaginal wall as a means of glycogen breakdown. Now, on top of that, there is there's also a test conducted in the lab called a whiff test, and that is literally a test that looks for fishy odors. So the sample is mixed with a potassium drop, and if it creates a fishy type odor, then that is a positive test. Now the treatment for bacterial vaginosis is either oral metronidazole or PV clindamycin, which is what we are going to talk about now. Now we are going to focus on the cream form uh, because the capsule form is used as an alternative to most treatments and then also as an adjunct to aminoglycosides for your acute wounds. So looking at the pharmacokinetics of the cream, it only has a 5% bioavailability. Okay, now that generally means that it's by design, you don't really want it to kill all the bacteria that's within the vaginal wall. And also it can usually determine how long the treatment regime is going to go on for. Now it does distribute throughout the body. So this does have 5% absorption throughout the body, which means you can have systemic signs and symptoms, but it's distribution half-life is around one and a half to 2.8 hours, and its peak serum level doesn't occur until 10 to 14 hours after treatment. Like most drugs, it's metabolized by the liver, has to get into the bloodstream, distributed around before it gets to the liver, and then it is excreted by the urine. Now, don't get the cream mixed up with the foam that is around because the foam's bioavailability and excretion levels are very very low okay so there's a lot of a lot of evidence out there that pretty much says the foam is not very effective at treating the bacterial vaginosis itself okay how it works its pharmacodynamics is very similar to a macroloid even though technically it's not a macroloid okay it falls into a smaller class of antibiotic for your lincosamide. Okay, but regardless, the way that it works is it does act on the S50 subunit. If you're having trouble remembering the different main classes of antibiotics and how they interact, then click on the link above and it will take you back to pharmacology looking at all the different antibiotics. But looking at clindamycin itself, especially in cream form, so clindamycin, as mentioned, is an antibacterial agent. It now binds to the 50S ribosomal subunits of susceptible bacteria. Okay, now the tablet form is bactericidal or and bacteriostatic, depending on the concentration. The cream one is mostly designed to prevent elongation of peptide chains. Okay, now it interferes with um, the peptidal transfers and thereby suppresses protein synthesis of the bacteria. So it's mostly your bacterial static and allows your body to use its natural defenses in order to kill it. Now, if you want to have full understanding of what protein synthesis is, even though it's not focused on bacterial protein synthesis, the process is still the same. You can have a look at the episode on protein synthesis itself. Okay, moving on to the characteristics of the drug itself, we need to know what sort of things to look out for. So there's a few warning signs associated with clindamycin. The main one is obviously hypersensitivity to clindamycin or lincomycins themselves. Okay, and one that's pretty much been proven for all antibiotics and it's something that we need to always mention. So pseudomembrous colitis can occur with pretty much any bacterial agent that you use. So all antibiotics have this warning that if you give it to someone, they have the risk of getting really bad colitis type infections, C. diff or your pseudomembrous colitis itself. 
So if the person gets significant diarrhea or abdominal cramps after the administration of any antibiotics, that antibiotic is to be stopped immediately. Now the main adverse effects for the cream include dryness and burning and itching. Okay, usually because it's associated with an increased risk of forming candidus uh, because of the absence of bacteria that has been removed from the vaginal cavity. Okay, now if you want adverse effects for the tablets, then you're encouraged to look it up before administration, uh, as always, and as with all these drugs, consult a medical officer as well. Now as far as interactions go, the good news is, is there's no known major or minor interactions with the vaginal creams. Okay, now that doesn't mean you can give it willy-nilly without any adverse effects, okay, but there has no drug interaction. When we're dealing with a capsule, just to mention a few of the serious ones that you're likely to come across, is recent vaccinations or vaccinations that are planned during the, tr during the treatment um, that you'll be using clindamycin. And also your paralytic megs, like your vecuronium uh, or, or your rocuronium. Now, I don't obviously expect people to be on this um, therapeutically, but if they have surgery lined up in the next couple of days, and they're going to be on clindamycin, then it needs to be um, something that they're aware of and probably need to consult the surgical team. Okay, let's finish up on some clinical take-homes. We'll just mention again, whenever using antibiotics, if you give an antibiotic and the patient has significant diarrhea or abdominal cramps, that antibiotic is to stop and they are to go seek further medical aid. When handing over the cream to the patient, provide patient education. Okay, and the easiest way to do it is never throw out the box for these particular ones, even if it says room in your kit, so then they can administer it in accordance with the packet direction. Make sure they clean their hands pre and post, okay, because you don't want to increase bacterial flora. Get them to lie down post-administration, that's why it's best to do it at night, after their last wee, and before going to bed. They should always avoid douching in general. Now for those that don't know, douching is just uh, like a cleansing of the, of the vaginal cavity. Okay, it's a bit of a fad, but medically it's, it's not recommended. Okay, there's supposed to be some element of bacteria in the vaginal cavity. And it's often a causative agent of bacterial vaginosis. But whilst they're undergoing the treatment, absolutely no douching, no use of tampons, and avoid intercourse and the use of toys during the treatment. Also let them know that the cream has been known to damage condoms and diaphragms, so it's quite destructive on plastics, rubbers, okay, and it can last up to 72 hours post-treatment. So their last dose, three days after that, uh, the condoms can still be damaged. So as long as they're aware, then they won't have any pregnancy scares or pregnancies when they don't want them. Okay, that finishes the medication lessons on clindamycin. So until next time, take care.